everyone to the latest installment of EMS Focus, a collaborative federal webinar series. I'm John Kramer, the director of the NHTSA Office of EMS. Together with our federal partners, NHTSA's Office of EMS is focused on advancing a national vision for EMS. The projects we undertake and the resulting resources for the community help with systems improvement, measure the health of EMS systems nationwide, and deliver the data that EMS leaders need to advance their individual systems. Another role of the Office of EMS is to educate the EMS community on new innovations, processes, and technologies that can, in the end, help provide quality care and efficient patient care. This free webinar series, hosted by the NHTSA Office of EMS, is a unique opportunity for federal EMS agencies and industry experts to share information throughout the EMS community. EMS Focus conducts webinars and all those providers have provided EMS systems with abundant, easy to access data. Local and state EMS organizations are now gathering more and more information, but many are still wondering on how to use it effectively. Today, our two speakers will share how our agencies, how, I'm sorry, how their agencies are finding innovative ways to use their data, not only to improve performance, but also to measure and report the value that EMS providers provide to their patients, their agencies, and their communities. Something that's becoming more and more important to policymakers, payers, and the public, and obviously to EMS providers. Our guests today will discuss two different local initiatives that highlight the great work happening across the nation to advance our profession of EMS. Both will demonstrate the importance of collecting accurate data and then using and sharing the information from that data. Just as important, however, they serve as examples of the power of cooperation and collaboration and the possibilities that exist when individuals and organizations decide to dedicate themselves to always finding ways to improve. First this afternoon, we'll hear how Gold Cross Ambulance in Salt Lake City, Utah, is connecting to a health information exchange and how that's impacted their quality improvement efforts. Then we'll learn about the cool things that are happening at New Jersey's JFK Medical Center EMS, where they're calculating a rapid emergency medical score to measure the impact EMS is actually having on patients' condition, treatment, and outcomes. We have a great panel of speakers joining us this afternoon. Brooke Burton is the Quality Director for Gold Cross Ambulance in Salt Lake City. Brooke has over 20 years of EMS experience working as a paramedic in rural to super urban environments. She now specializes in EMS performance improvement. Brooke is a member of the National EMS Management Association, serves on the steering committee of the newly formed National EMS Quality Alliance, and was the recipient of the American Ambulance Association 2016 Award for Best Quality Improvement Program. Joining her is Jamie Chebra, who is the Director of Emergency Medical Services for JFK Medical Center in Edison, New Jersey. Jamie's background also spans 20 years in healthcare and EMS, specializing in high-performance EMS administration. Jamie and his staff were recently recognized as the Outstanding EMS Agency in New Jersey 
for the second time in four years. Jamie also serves as a committee chair for the National EMS Management Association and vice president of the New Jersey Association of Paramedic Programs. At this time, I'd like to now turn it over to Brooke Burton. Brooke? Thank you, Dr. Kramer, for that introduction. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about my service. Gold Cross has multiple divisions across the state of Utah. Uh, we're in the central area, the southern and the eastern area, and I'm a quality director for the different divisions of Gold Cross. There's a little bit of information on your screen about our agency. What I'd like to tell you is the story of how this all started. Um, several years ago, I attended a conference where I saw an EMS agency uh, speak about connecting their data and getting outcomes back from a local hospital. And when I saw that, I was just um, so thrilled with the prospect of getting outcomes back for our providers that I went on a mission to try to bring that to my area. And for several years, I knocked on doors of hospitals, I talked to administrators, I talked to staff, I tried to get anyone I could to listen to me um, to see if they would connect their hospital data with our data so that we could get outcomes back. And for several years, I had doors slammed in my face. Um, people told me that they didn't really think it was a race to saying, we can't connect our data with other people's data, we can't share that, you know, that I had people tell me on a pay with. So I started to get really discouraged and I had almost done this. good information sharing in your time. That was the lever number of facility and a contractor in some process of establishing connections to the chi. So eventually we will have
more on those side buttons and pull up all of the diagnosis creation there, like disease and some other care. And then I am able to pull up the full ED um, notes from that patient, all of the, the lab work from that patient. And, and so, so in the next slide, we are additional information and we can do a very thorough full case review for this patient. So, you know, we can look at things like, did this sepsis develop once the patient was in the hospital? Was it something that we missed on initial impression, different things like that? And it can really turn into a valuable teaching moment for those crews. So um, it's been great as far as education, right on the spot. Um, it's also let us look at some different data um, in aggregate so that we can do training for uh, all of our crews were able to spotlight some of these cases. And so it's been, so these are really nice for us to be able to look at all of the data kind of together as a whole. And this one looks at sepsis. So you can see um, the ones that have a high number, a high percentage are the primary impressions that came back as sepsis. So acute respiratory distress, there has a pretty large number, altered mental status, generalized weakness. So we can educate our providers that those high percentage cases should be high suspicion for sepsis because we can see that a lot of times those particular impressions are coming back as septic patients. And ESO allows us to do those automatic reports for CHF, sepsis, STEMI, and stroke. We can also customize reports in Excel, uh, which is really helpful to us. So I'm able to take all of this raw data, um, which really isn't helpful, like you see here, but we can throw it into a pivot. What's nice about these is that we can sort what comes back for that impression hospital diagnosis. So in this one, generalized weakness, um, I just <laughs> so and have a really nice conversation about like about that and a learning moment and I learned something that day too so it's been really nice one of the biggest benefits of this is that it's really brought people into the quality improvement office in a positive way they come in to learn they come in with questions they see these things that is information we would have never had otherwise 
and providers because of this program. Another thing that they've said is a great benefit is that it's just like a pat on the back um, because 99% of the time it's, it's telling them, yes, we were on the right track with that patient. And that's been a really significant benefit for us and our crews. Everyone told me I was, you know, at CHF and it came back as CHF and I was just really, you know, glad that I was on the right track with that patient. And that's something that we never had before in ES a little bit, I think, and we if it's not necessarily a critical call, um, but just patients that we get a little bit more emotionally invested in. And this gives us that closed loop follow-up of, you know, what became of that patient. Some people have told me, even though they've seen that their patient was deceased, it's still kind of given them closure on, which has been helpful for them. Um, some of the other benefits that we received from this is that we get billing and demographic info outcomes back as well. So for those patients who are um, altered and we're not able to get all of the information that uh, we can get on normal patients. We get outcome information back from the hospital after that patient uh, has been registered and they figure out who that patient is and what's going on with them. And then we don't have to request that information later through a records request in the records department and tie up a lot of time with our people and filling people um, to get that information. It just automatically is coming over now. So um, our, our billing department can access that information as well and and uh, update that as needed. This has been great to be able to gear our training towards actual data and outcomes. Uh, you know, before we just guessed on what we should train on and we did CME kind of based on the standard rotation of things. And now we can really look at where are the areas that we can improve? Where are we deficient? And we can gear our training in those directions. So that's been really good for us as well. Um, and it's just, improving our overall patient care and in our community as well. So for that uh, fall case, we had a lot of discussion about falls and we were able to look at a lot of our fall data and now we're actually participating in a program with the state on fall prevention just based on one outcome that came back and the discussions that came from that. So we're really hoping to improve overall community health with this and not just um, our individual patient care. So thank you for the time today, and we'll have questions at the end. Thank you, Brooke. If folks out there like me, they're right now extremely envious about the relationship you've been able to establish through your HIE. As Brooke mentioned, there will be time for uh, questions. After Jamie's presentation, I would encourage folks to submit your questions and uh, type them in so that we can get them on board. We are recording uh, the entire session and saving the questions. So if it's not possible to get to all the questions at the end of the presentation, we will uh, follow up individually with you on your specific questions. With that, I'm happy to turn it over to Jamie Chebra. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Kramer. Um, my name is Jamie Chebra, and I'm the director for EMS at JFK Medical Center in Edison, New Jersey. And yeah, New Jersey is different. Um, we're one of the unique states where we're a hospital-based ALS system that requires two advanced providers on every paramedic unit. Um, we are a tiered system, which is legislatively mandated, and our BLS, the BLS tier is, is pseudo-regulated, I guess is the better way to say it. Um, we have a certificate of need coverage areas for advanced life support coverage. So there's it's kind of a, a nice safety net to that degree. Um, and it's allowed us to do some, some very collaborative things. As we start looking at JFK EMS, just a little bit of background. Um, the program here in New Jersey specific to JFK has existed since 1976. In 2011, based on a staff initiative, um, the hospital made a major investment and expanded the single fly, paramedic fly car service into BLS critical care transport, um, a control center and education department, and the community outreach function. Um, and in, in return, the idea was to be able to give them a concept that EMS did make a difference in pre-hospital care and length of stay. So as we started looking at oper oper uh, ways to, to show this and different opportunities within the industry, we came across the REM score. 
I'd be remiss in the, not to say thanks to John Washington for bringing this to my attention and the support of uh, Mark Bober, the assistant director here, and Scott Phelps, the director of OEMS, um, for really latching on to the idea and fueling the concept. So when we look at the concept of REM score, and uh, on the next slide you'll see, that the goal was to define a quantifiable data point that EMS actually made a difference in the pre-hospital environment and made an impact on hospital and on a life to stay within the hospital. The uh, idea was to enhance the concept of the triple aim that we did indeed provide access, quality, and at a great cost to, to our patients. The REM score is designed for our purposes to show value in EMS, in real money, not just in the concept that we do good and we know we do good. But we also wanted to have a defensible position for EMS funding as the competitive nature of reimbursement got more aggressive um, as time went on. So delving into the idea of the REM score, what exactly is a REM score? The REM score is an aggregate score that um, is a couple studies that empirically show that the REM score is a good predictor of both surgical and non-surgical cases for morbidity and mortality with uh, a NAS ratio variation of 1.4 overall for, for patients with a positive impact on the REM score. And I'll get into that a little bit more. The idea is that you look at the formula that takes the patient's age, their pulse rate, their mean arterial pressure, their respiratory rate, their pulse ox, and their Glasgow coma score, aggregated into a score that goes from 0 to 26. And the higher the score, the worse the condition of the patient. The studies have shown that if you can reduce REM score in an in-hospital environment by one, you do adjust the odds ratio by a 1.4 uh, margin. So it's real data that supports the concept that this makes a difference. Um, we thought that it would be novel to bring this out into the pre-hospital arena. And it had been researched before, but there was a gap in the literature that really defined as to whether it's a, a good model for identifying improvement based on EMS intervention. So as we look back through the data, you can see that there's a couple studies out there. And with all these things being in play and the idea that we need to be be able to show value and make a difference. Our competition is not only internal to our organization, but we start looking at the external factors and the disruptors in the, in the pre-hospital arrangement. The idea that Uber is a better alternative than ambulances has been splashed all over the news. So how do you combat that? How do you say, no, you know, it's better to call ambulance. You get better quality care. We bring the emergency department to you. And we can ensure navigation through the otherwise complicated um, healthcare system. That's kind of where we went to the REM score. We gravitated towards the idea of the REM score as a, as a way to show that, not only to the hospital who invested in us, but to our patients and to other constituents. So, I'm just going to go to the next slide if you could. Um, we initially started calculating by a retrospective EPCR report custom built by Zoll to extrapolate the, the rapid emergency medicine score. All staff, as part of the orientation, are trained on the use of the score in the EPCR. That's not necessarily to say that they're proficient or consistent with it. And as we move through further through the slides, we'll talk about some of the improvements that we've seen over the years by making close call rules and forcing them to do a REM score when, when, when they're able. So the way we do the REM score in here at JFK is that all patients transported get a REM score on their first assessment, their first assessed vitals, and their last assessed vitals. So the idea is that we can compare the delta between the initial contact and our transfer of care. Initially, 27, 2015, all the way up through 2017, as we developed this program, we were doing this as a soft, almost a pilot, with select groups um, until we rolled it out to the larger group in 2017. One of the things that was unique to us, in, at least in our in our catchment area, is the idea that our BLS do carry pulse oximetry, and we did calculate REMS for everything to include our interfacility transfers. So that was ALS, BLS, and SCT funneling REM scores um, into what was a very raw database, um, an Excel database that required pivot tables and some extrapolation to draw out some data prior to the, to the Zoll report, and even post Zoll report, there's still a lot of manual aspects of marrying the data up. So as we moved through this process, we looked into some of our results. And um, in 2017, we had a total of 
1,500 clean REM scores. Now, our service volume is about 37,000 a year. So we, we were really kind of limited in our success rate. And some of the things that skewed the data was the idea that the uh, um, providers were unfamiliar with, with uh, putting it in the, in the chart right. Um, they didn't feel that it was appropriate. They were too busy. The chart wouldn't close. And every other excuse that your providers have, have offered you in the past as to why they couldn't complete the charts or complete a specific action. One of the things that was, um, was more interesting as we moved into 2018, um, we looked at marrying up our calls from dispatch to patient contact to patients that have positive REM score and compared those patients' length of stay by DRG with patients who were admitted for the same DRG that did not come in via JFK EMS or, or came in by means other than JFK EMS. And the results were kind of profound. Um, in 2017, our length of stay comparison for sepsis admissions, all admissions under the sepsis umbrella in the DRG, we had a 1.5 um, reduction in length of stay. In other words, if JFK at EMS had brought you in and you were admitted with a sepsis diagnosis, you spent about a day and a half less in the hospital than if you came in by other means. That jumped to 2.5 days in 2018 after we implemented a pre-hospital sepsis protocol. So we're able to quantifiably justify the, the, the investment in you know, pre-hospital lactate meters and temperature probes um, by showing an improved length of stay. Same thing applied to difficulty breathers, difficulty breathing, um, and chest pain. So as we start looking at these data points, we can show truly that our interventions in the pre-hospital environment are making a difference in the in-hospital environment. And we're making a difference in reducing the amount of time people are spending in the hospital, ideally as a result of that reducing cost to payers, um, reducing burden on the health system, which was the overall goal of REMS. And, uh, you know, we're still in very infantile phases of this. We, our, net, our ends are very low. Um, there's a lot of variables that still need to be ironed out. Um, but initial read on the data is very promising. Um, and I'd like to see it expand further into the, into the world of EMS. You know, one of the things that uh, um, we see as opportunities is this was an opportunity that organizations can share information. Um, we had uh, other organizations, even within the state, who were very interested in participating in this concept, but wanted IRB approval or had to, you know, have some sort of administrative approval that they were hesitant to provide in order to access the data required to provide REM scores and a universal database. So the idea being to reach out through the federal NEMSIS system after the July 2018 update to be able to access vitals and see if some of the some of the local data that we're seeing here is reflected in the national data captured in the NEMSIS database. Um, it was a conceptually new thing to be able to show this at a local level and to provide this value analysis back to the hospital. Hey, your investment paid off. We're, we're reducing length of stay in a lot of areas. Um, and I, I think honestly, we did make a good start in the process of quantifying the impact EMS has on pre-hospital care and long-term patient outcome. Um, at this point, I think we have a pause for questions. Great, thank you so much, Jamie. I guess as, as we're starting to uh, get the questions loaded up, uh, I wanna follow up you had, had made a comment about um, the field providers' engagement in calculating the REM score. Um, what was their reaction? And yeah, I can just envision uh, folks saying, "Well, this is another thing we got to do." How, how did you overcome field resistance to be involved in that? Um, multiple beatings. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, we. Uh... <laughs> One of the things that we pride ourselves here on with JFK is to, tr to be as transparent as possible. And being field providers and not far removed from the street, most of us, the idea of adding another re responsibility onto field providers, we were very sensitive to. So it was important for us to guide them through the process of why we're doing this. What are some of the bigger issues in healthcare that are going on and how could they impact us? Bring back some of the larger concepts of providing quality care at a um, reduced cost while improving access. And as we continue this mantra throughout, you know, 2015 to 2018, every staff meeting, every opportunity to engage the staff, 
posting results of the REM score, however, however preliminary, um, and showing people um, that, yeah, you know what, this is meaningful things you're doing. It's not just necessarily the um, one extra step that management is asking you to do. As a matter of fact, just prior to this webinar, I had a very engaging conversation with a pre-hospital provider, and she came to me and she said, so tell me about the REM scores. I understand you're doing a webinar. And I was able to share with her with the data that we saw on the slide previous, which is, by the way, very fresh data. Um, and she was absolutely impressed and was bought into that process. And that same sense of excitement and enthusiasm gets very contagious amongst the staff when they feel that they're um, engaged in a process that's actually validating what they do. You know, we've always, as pre-hospital providers, at least from my perspective, felt that we did a good job and, and we made meaningful difference to patient care. But to be able to see that in numbers and reduce the days in the hospital and the overall improvement in patient care, um, it became very meaningful for the staff. So, yeah, the initial ask was difficult, but the buy-in was, was incredible. Thank you. Um, Brooke, I think you sort of alluded to this in, in one of your comments as well, but, um, you know, obviously one of the concerns that many EMS uh, field providers have is they drop the patient off in the emergency department and don't hear any follow-up. Um, how, how did your exchange of information through the HIE um, affect folks' uh, perception of the follow-up issue? Uh, I think they've just been really grateful to have the follow-up. Um, everything I've heard from our field providers has been positive as far as the information that they've been getting back. Even if it's something that, you know, showed that they, um, you know, had a different outcome than what they expected with the patient, they've taken those as learning experiences and really um, focused on looking up information or asking other providers that information. It's uh, spurred a lot of discussion amongst them and everything I've heard back from our providers has been positive both psychologically and for their clinical practice. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question here for Brooke. If an entity participates in the HIE, does data for all patients get shared or is there a, a voluntary ability of the patient by patient uh, to determine if they participate in the feedback process? Yeah, that's a great question. Right now, the CHI is completely voluntary. Um, it's not mandated in any way. Um, so the, both the agencies that are providing, uh, that are participating and the patients have the option to not put data in. Um, most of the hospitals I've, I've seen do put a great deal of information in and we are able to get a great deal of information out of it. Uh, they are able to pick and choose what fields they, um, they give information to the CHI in their data sets, as are we. We are putting in our full data right now, as many of the hospitals are. Um, but if they don't want to release a certain piece of data or a field of data, they can opt out of releasing that. Um, also, patients are able to opt out of the CHI. So uh, information for patients is automatically submitted, but a patient can a file request with the CHI to opt out of that system. And I have had a couple of times where we've tried to access information um, for outcomes on a patient and it's come back as that patient has opted out. So um, that's just, I guess, that's something that you have to take with a grain of salt along with the good is that sometimes you're just not going to be able to get 100% of the data back. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, could you explain how the REM score has been validated? Sure. A little background on the REM score. It's it's an attenuation of the Apache 2 score. Um, it was validated in a 19, I'm sorry, 2004 study that was conducted by Olson et al., um, which validated the hospital, the pre -hospital, the in-hospital use of the REM score in the emergency department. Um, that was a prospective cohort study of a 1,200-bed university hospital. They enrolled about 12,000 non-surgical patients um, and found that REMS was actually superior to RAPS, which is one of its competitors. Um, in specificity and sensitivity for uh, uh, morbidity, mortality in hospital. The other study, the more recent study in 2014, was conducted by B.F. Imhoff, and he validated the REM study, the REM score as in a, in a surgical population. And this 
this is done actually in a, ret in a retrospective perspective and um, showed that REMS had a more specific and sensitive outcome than both the revised trauma score, the injury severity score, and the shock index. So the validation is there, but there are gaps in literature. And one of the things, ideally, this evolves to the limited data that we have can become part of an impetus to validate this as a true pre-hospital measure of quality that can influence payer and, uh, and carry the industry forward into the future. Are you aware of other EMS systems that have uh, adopted RAMS and are using it in their daily practice? Um, I'm currently not aware. Uh, I know AMR had did do had done some studies on the uh, on AMR in the past. Um, I don't know if any of that was published. I know that Northwell was working with some RAP scores pre hospital but I don't know that that was done daily. I think that was done as a retrospective aggregate. I believe we're currently the only one doing a REM score um, as part of the daily operations and a, and, a, and, a, and a vital sign. Great, thank you. Brooke, what percentage of the transported patients are you currently receiving hospital outcome data about? Do you have an idea? Yeah, so right now um, about six of our uh, hospitals are putting data into the CHI and another six are still in some type of negotiation. So for the ones that we that are actually putting information into the chi, we're we're at around 40 to 50 percent that are coming through that we're getting outcomes on. This is still pretty new and we're building it. So we're working through a lot of those technical issues as far as how are we matching records and and uh, how are things coming together. So that's been one of the challenges that we started out at about 20%, so I think the fact that we're around 50% now is pretty good. Um, also, we're probably getting, you know, around 800, 900 um, different connections back a month uh, right now in the in the process. So, do you have a, a sense of how quickly the outcome data is available after the EMS incident? It comes back almost instantly. So uh, once our crews have locked that call and it, that information gets sent immediately to Chi, as soon as the hospitals uh, do registration, we'll get a registration outcome back for that patient. Uh, um, once they're diagnosed and there's a diagnosis put in the hospital system, we'll get the diagnosis back. And then we'll get another outcome back once that patient's been discharged or admitted. So we may get multiple outcomes back on one patient throughout the process. And we can watch as the patient goes through their stay at the hospital from um, their, their original admit all the way through their discharge and disposition. So, you know, those will just come through as they happen. So if a patient's admitted, it could take several weeks before we get like a final uh, disposition on them because it, they may be in the hospital that long. But we do get those almost immediately. Have you had any discussions yet with your hospitals or with the HIE to attempt to try and allow for real-time data exchange that would potentially uh, modify the care that your crews are giving to the patient in real time? We haven't done that yet. Um, we. We have some concerns with, with giving our crews full access to the CHI, and we've, we've talked to the CHI about that a little bit. I, I have the ability to log into the CHI and, and see any record there. And let me tell you, it's a huge responsibility that <laughs> I don't, you know, I, it, it, you have to be very careful with having access to all of that information and how you utilize it and make sure that it's very appropriately used. So, um, to, be able to have people be able to access all of that data the way that it's set up right now um, just isn't isn't really something that I feel comfortable with um, as the quality director. But we're definitely talking to them all the time about ways that we can use the system and use the information. Um, so those are definitely discussions that we could figure out a workaround for some of those issues that we would love to have. Another really interesting piece that came out of all of this is I've talked to several of the hospitals now um, that I that wouldn't connect with us before and showed them what we're doing with all this and showed them the data and the reports 
and I've received a lot more um, support and interest in the program now that I can visually show them how it's being used versus just talking about it as a concept. So that's been a really interesting shift. And now they're coming to us and asking us how, how can we maybe can connect directly so that they can get that information right into their patient care record as opposed to having to log into the CHI and pull it out that way. So we are now re-establishing some of those original conversations about direct links that we didn't have initially, that didn't go anywhere initially. You, you both have alluded to the importance of uh, maintaining confidentiality and um, security of patient records, a la uh, the concern that almost every EMS provider has heard, you know, we, we can't share this information because of HIPAA concerns. How, how did you both address that, the, the concern about uh, compliance with HIPAA? Well, I'll just say that uh, it's it's a lot of education for just taking the letter of the law in there and showing them that it covers anyone who's in the continuum of care for that episode for that patient. So, you know, once you show them I am in this continuum of care and I am allowed to receive information on this whole episode of care because I'm involved in that continuum, no matter where I am on it at the beginning, middle or end, then I think that opens that door, but it's just that education piece and just showing that letter of the law. Which, which accidentally actually is reflecting the fact that even though we're providing the initial aspect of care, we do have access to uh, follow up and outcomes of that care, as long as it's directly related to the patient for which we cared. Jamie, any thoughts about the HIPAA concern? You know, one of the things that one of the things that we struggle with is, you know, the data that we're collecting on the REMS were specifically coming from the, the medical center for where I work. Um, getting other other agencies to to provide that data has been has been difficult, and the, their their organization cite HIPAA, and you know, how does this if this some sort of mystical REMS score is going to somehow expose us to HIPAA liability? And it's again a lot of education. Um, support from, from state level stakeholders is is the tactic we're taking now, and hopefully we'll gain some more traction. But it is an uphill battle. It is an uphill battle. And your um, the the outcomes that you've experienced with implementing the the REM score really is directly relating to uh, actual patient treatment given by the paramedics in the field. So. Uh, it, just maybe a little bit of background that um, helps answer that question. The the way, if you, if you notice the number of patients that are included, they're a lot less than the number of patients that we see. And the reason for that is a lot of patients we exclude right off the bat. If patients are taken to a facility other than ours, um, if the REM score is incomplete in the first or second, um, if the patient is admitted under an ICG-10 that doesn't relate to what they were, what their initial impression was. Was, uh, was documented by the paramedics, they're excluded. Um, and then in order to say that we make a difference versus not make a difference, um, or that the difference is related to our care, in order to be identified as um, part of the study, the DRG has to match an adequate number of patients who are brought in by non-EMS, by non-JFK EMS. So it, it's a little confusing to say, but um, if you'll imagine a patient contact produces an initial REM score. And then if there's a change in that REM score for the positive, in other words, if that REM score goes down um, based on the second or the transfer of care assessment, that patient's then tracked into through the ED um, through their admitting diagnosis and then tracked within the hospital through their DRG and compared based on patients who are not brought in by JFK. So the question is, does the actual treatment given by the paramedics um, affect REM score, that's the delta between the first and the second. So if there's, if there's no change, then they're kind of excluded early on. There's multiple layers to the data we're looking at, but for based on the, for the purposes of the presentation today, every patient that we've enrolled in this study has had a positive influence on the REM, store, REM score, and they've had a, we've had a greater than 40% influence um, in that specific general impression. So 
does the REM score equate to improvement? I'd have to say that if there's a change in the REM score from the initial assessment to the transfer, my knee-jerk reaction based on the data, based on what we're seeing behind the scenes and, and within the hospital and the decrease in the comparison like to stay, I would say it does. Great, thank you. Brooke, you talked about the benefits of the connection to the HIE on the EMS side. Have you gotten feedback or heard anything from the hospitals about change in their having access to the EMS data and the impact that that's had? So right now the hospitals haven't had a lot of change in their access to the EMS data. Um, they can log into the state EMS data repository and pull up our patient documentation. And now they can also log into the CHI and pull it up there as well. What I've learned from talking to a lot of the hospitals is that many of the people who need to access our, our patient care record don't even know about the CHI yet or how to access it or who has a login at their facility. So there's a lot of education that still has to be done there on the hospital end um, for, for them to figure out how to get that information. Um, most of them are still logging into the state database. And that's why uh, we're having a lot more of those discussions now with them as we're educating them about the process is to do those direct connections with us so that our record goes directly into their patient care report um, instead of using the CHI as kind of like a middleman. Um, but those are all just conversations that we're having with them right now, now that we're kind of showing the value piece of this whole project. How is the EMS rec uh, EPCR matched up with the patient's hospital record? Do you use the medical record number in, in your EPCR or how, how do those get matched up? So each, uh, each patient visit has a specific encounter number at the hospital. Um, some of them call it a medical record number. Some of them call it an encounter number, like everybody has their own little name for it. But it's the unique number that's identified uh, for that particular visit of patient care. And what our crew does is they enter that into an area in their electronic patient care report, um, that, that unique number. And those are the things that come together at the CHI to match up the records from the hospital and our record. So there's a very high confidence level that the, the records are matching up appropriately. Yes, and CHI even looks at the patient name, social date of birth, and some of those other things too. They have a whole kind of matching uh, matrix set up. And if certain aspects don't match, that are pretty obvious, even if we have the right number, um, it won't send us outcomes on that patient if it can't verify that it's the correct patient. Got it. Uh, Jamie, have you been able to use what you've found so far to, um, in, a, in a positive way to get more funding or more reimbursement for the EMS program? Or, so one or of the go ahead. No, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, and if it's not directly related to funding, what's what's the value gained to um, both EMS leadership and hospital leadership? So the answer to both of those questions is somewhat entwined. We've not gone to payers with this information yet. Um, as, as again, I said, I think the end's a little bit too small to have a, a large enough data set to compel um, a change in reimbursement. But the hospital being our primary employer, um, does appreciate that, and we have been able to secure additional capital funding and operational funding as a result. Um, the the concept of you know being a hospital-based system makes us a little bit unique in, in, in a lot of parts of the United States. But um, ideally, if we could get this to be uh, a broader charge and more agencies carrying the water um, with the concept of the REM score. Um, Ideally, it would be something that the payers could look at and say that, yeah, there's value based in EMS. And, you know, so a lot of the efforts and a lot of the energies being funneled in the healthcare system and healthcare reform can be influenced by emergency medical services, whether it be at a community paramedicine level or at an acute episodic level. Um, and perhaps the reimbursement that, you know, is being doled out for the efforts of EMS isn't necessarily proportionate to the benefits they're providing their patients. 
Yeah. Um, I'm going to shift the focus here for, for just a little bit, and I'm going to ask this question without in any way trying to minimize the yeoman's effort that each of you did with your individual uh, programs, but um, how did you sell this to your agency's leadership and, and take advantage of your leadership uh, helping sell this program to the hospitals, the HIE, uh, the stakeholders with which you've been involved? That may be a little bit nebulous. I guess I'm asking, how did you sell your leadership that this was an important thing to do and get their support for it? Brooke, would you like to go first or you want me to jump in? Oh, you can jump in, Jamie. I'll go second. Oh, thank you. Um, the idea that EMS was important um, as part of the hospital's mission to be a community-based health provider was was never questioned or, or, or you know, in any way doubted. EMS as an extension of the emergency department was an investment that the hospital had to make. So, as far as tracking the REMS were and being and using it to show value back to our to our health system, it was an organic um, effort internally. You know, some external influence from you know, like the likes of John Washko and the folks up at Northwell. But the idea of showing that we made a difference and we weren't just running around with lights and sirens all over town, um, that we actually were providing pre-hospital care. The idea was that you know, EMS, a well, a well-funded and a well, a well-managed EMS program, would extend the emergency department to the homes of every patient that called 911. Um, was great. And we have quality markers internal to the hospital. So the idea of carrying quality markers external, you know, that made a difference, not things like response times or, um, or other, you know, arbitrary measures of success, but were we really providing good medicine and was our medicine really making a difference? And that's a very difficult thing to quantify. And it seems as though the REM score came closest to that out of all the things that we looked at. Brooke, any parting thoughts? Yeah, on our project, um, convincing our leadership that outcomes were important was pretty easy because outcomes in EMS has always kind of been this mythical unicorn that we've all chased. Anyone who's been in EMS a long time is, has always wanted outcomes. So convincing my organization's leadership that that was an important thing to pursue was, was easy. Um, convincing people outside of EMS that it was important for us to have that information was more challenging. And I think it's because when you explain it as a concept, it's it's a lot more difficult to get people to understand the value of it and understand the value to them. Um, like I said, once we got the project going and we were able to visually show some of this information to the hospitals and, and other players, we had a lot more success with people getting on board so that's it's kind of an if you build it they will come like if you can find some way to make it happen um you know people will see the value in it and understand it great well we're fast approaching the top of the hour i would really like to thank both brooke and jamie for their participation today congratulate them on um excellent um, programs and excellent presentations and thank the listeners for uh, submitting really good follow-up questions as well reminder to the listeners this has been recorded it will be available on ems.gov uh, in the very near future we will be working on the next webinar for probably a couple of months and we'll have that information available on ems.gov. And if there are particular topics or information that you would like to be shared as part of this webinar series, please don't hesitate to email us and offer those suggestions as well. Um, I'll thank the staff that's supporting the uh, logistics of this going together. And thank you all again for a fantastic webinar. Have a great day, folks.